Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Katie Sawyer. I'm Senior Director of Donor and Community Engagement with the San Diego Foundation. And I'm so happy that you're all able to be with us for today's conversation. This is the fifth in our Enabling Community Solutions webinar series. And the goals of this series are to learn more about some of the critical issues facing our community, to hear from community experts who are leading highly collaborative, innovative work in these spaces, and to spotlight solutions that, that we can all be a part of, both as individuals and as a part of the San Diego Foundation family. And today we'll be talking about access to the outdoors and building community resilience through equitable outdoor access. I have been really looking forward to this conversation. I'm excited about this webinar in particular because the outdoors has always been so meaningful personally in my life. It's been a space of connection and uh, growth and peace, uh, sometimes a humbling space. And I know that's true for many of you who are in attendance today too. And it's important that we make sure that everyone in our community, especially young people and families, are able to reap the benefits of the outdoors and, and to enjoy the natural beauty of this amazing space that we live in. So I'm looking forward to a great discussion today. A couple quick Zoom housekeeping items before we kick off. Um, we are using the webinar view, so that is why those in attendance, you don't have the ability to turn on your camera or to unmute yourself, but we do want to hear what questions you have and make sure to have a chance to get them answered. So I would ask that if you have any questions for about the issue or for our experts in particular, that you enter them through either the chat or Q&A fields at the bottom of your screen. We're not going to save time for questions and answers at the end of the program. I would ask instead that you just enter them along the way and I will make sure to get them answered either live by our experts or if we're running a little short on time for whatever reason, we'll follow up with you individually afterwards with an answer to your question. And with no further ado, I am delighted to introduce our phenomenal panel of speakers today. We have with us today, Lesford Duncan, who is Senior Director of Programs at Outdoor Outreach. OO's mission is to connect youth to the transformative power of the outdoors, to realize the positive attitude and behavioral changes that help them become happy, healthy, and successful adults. Uh, Les has deep experience in trauma-informed work to address childhood adversity and build resilience. Um, he also does things like uh, run 50 miles for fun, so which I find both uh, personally inspiring and also deeply disturbing. We also have with us today Courtney Baltiski, who is Director of Advocacy and Strate uh, Strategic Partnership with YMCA Community Support Services. She's leading highly collaborative systems change work, including working to make sure that outdoor experience are part of every family's experience. She works to make sure that outdoor access includes justice, equity, and diversity and inclusion. And we have with us today, Maria Guadalupe Mendez Arroyo, who is a recent graduate of Outdoor Outreach's leadership program. Uh, she's also a senior at King Chavez Community High School, and she's gotten very involved in advocacy work. She's met with legislators like Congressman Mike Levin and Todd Gloria when he was still at the State Assembly, advocating for the importance of outdoor access and building parks in her community. And uh, she is headed to USD in the fall. Congrats, Maria, so excited for you. And we have our own San Diego Foundation in-house expert, my talented colleague, Heather Rossetti. Heather manages the Thrive Outside Initiative, which is a, a network of local partners to increase outdoor opportunities for youth and families in San Diego County. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that initiative in just a few minutes. To reframe our conversation, Les, I'm gonna turn to you. Um, the transformative power of the outdoors is right there front and center of, in the mission of outdoor outreach. What is it that can be so transformative about outdoor spaces? Absolutely, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to recap kind of some of what was, what was in the video and hopefully, hopefully we get a chance to share it as well because um, it's, it's hugely powerful and just wanted to give a huge thanks to, um, to our partners at Wonder Camp and Outbound Collective and Hoka um, for helping to put together this film that really told um, the powerful stories of Lexus and of Tati um, who helped to, who, who really found resilience 
um, through outdoor engagement. And they tell their story so powerfully, but really, um, really the importance, the, the, transform, the transformative power of the outdoors is through the healing effect that it has for so many of us, um, through the resilience building effect that it has for so many of us. Outdoor recreation is really more than just a nice to have. It's more than just something that is fun to do. Um, it's really central and critical to not only our physical health, but also to our mental health and well being. And I think COVID has really showed us that in a really powerful way. Um, but I think we have the film loaded up here. So um, I'll let Lexis tell her story way better than I tried to summarize. Here. Nothing was safe, like where I lived, where I went, walking to school. My brain just never shut off. It was always something. It was just this constant whirling of like panic and anxiety and fear. My home life, my home situation wasn't good. Um, it was very much hustle and bustle, survival mode. Let's figure out how I'm going to eat today, if I can take food from school. Let's see if my mom's going to the hospital today, if she's going to be drugged up. Who's drinking? Who's screaming? If we're going to have a place to live. Anything that I could do to stay out of the house for long enough of a time, um, was the best thing for me. I didn't want to, to be at home. I think that's what I love about nature is that it's it's always welcoming, you know, no matter where you are, no matter how long it's been. It's just, it's a place where you can find some type of peace. I remember like camping in Joshua Tree for my first time. It was my first time camping, you know, first time pretty much everything getting at the top of that cave scramble and you could literally just see the whole world. It was just the first time where I had felt like, like the world is okay. You know, someone did this for me, someone helped me, someone encouraged me and was there that I know what it's like to have it, that it just, it feels like it's a necessary thing to give it someone who doesn't. But I have your bike, you're not gonna fall. It gave me the opportunity to build something within me that was stronger. Finding the outdoors and finding that inner peace, all I wanted to do was make it so that people could find that too, so that they could begin to heal. And, and Lexus is now on staff at Outdoor Outreach is an all around wonderful human. Um, and I, I know, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but it just brought me peace hearing her speak about the outdoors. Les, I wanna give you a chance to finish um, sharing what it is that makes the outdoor space so transformative. Uh, I think, I mean, I think the, that, that short clip um, really said it so powerfully, right? Like I, I remember that specific day when when uh, when we were filming. Um, that was on one of one of our programs with Radies Children's Hospital, working um, especially with youth um, that are um, that that are patients there at the hospital, outpatients um, struggling with anxiety, struggling with depression. And I remember one of the young ladies that she was helping, that she was coaching on that bike. She said, "You know, I I got you. I'm not going to let you fall." Um, and she really created this powerful connection with her. Um, I think at first over just like Harry Potter and kind of like the playful elements, but I, I think it was this perfect example of how being in those outdoor natural spaces and also being with, with a powerful supportive community um, of peers and of staff and instructors, um, how, how that really helps to, to build resilience for youth. Um, and important, I think importantly as well, one of the, you know, one of the things that, that is really important to us at After Outreach is how we also cultivate leadership in youth as well, or help to promote leadership in youth um, in powerful ways that allow them then to, to come on staff with us as instructors or to become um, phenomenal policy advocates. 
um, that are advocating for change and for outdoor equity and park access and park development in really powerful ways. And I think Maria um, is, is kind of a star example uh, of, one of one of our one of our leadership program graduates who has has really done uh, some tremendous work in policy advocacy. So I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Maria um, to maybe share a little bit about why why the outdoors is important to you. Um, hi guys, thanks for coming today. Um, for me, the I feel like the importance for outdoors is really crucial for us um, youth and also our families because many of us don't have the chance to you know go on hiking trips or even go to, um, to a, for a walk outside in the park or something. And I feel that that having OO with us, outdoor outreach, or having this this community where they allow us to have access to outdoors. It's really heartwarming and it creates it creates resiliency in someone because when they feel alone, the nature is what welcomes them. And that's that's why everyone should have access to outdoors and for them to to know that they're not alone, like they have nature that is um, that is with them and for them to take us a peaceful walk and know that they they can just let go of whatever they're going through and just embrace what's what they admire there in nature and just have peace and know that whatever they're going through, like they're going to have their ups and downs, but they'll know that they'll get through it, which I myself have experienced when um, joining outdoor outreach because before I used to suffer from anxiety and depression and just by going for a walk with outdoor outreach before the whole um, COVID pandemic, I felt like I was at ease. Like I felt that they had, I had a supportive team and I've made lots of friends throughout um, this experience, which I'm really grateful for. And look at me now, I'm here right now giving, giving my own thoughts and opinions about why the outdoors matters. And I feel like I've created, that I've created myself to be such an amazing person while advocating for parts and also by other stuff that matters to me, which I'm really grateful for. So I feel like having a, a space for us to go outside and just admire is something that everyone should be um, privileged to. And it's a right for everyone. And they deserve more than just having nature, but having peace within themselves and have a little space of, you know, just going for a walk with their families or even by themselves like every day and admire their, their strengths and their challenges that they have gone through in order to get to where they're at today. That's beautifully put. Maria, what, if you don't mind me asking, what are some of the things that you particularly enjoy doing outside? One of my favorite things I particularly like doing is hiking because I feel like just going for a walk around. Because um, I remember I went with Outdoor Outreach to the World Park and um, that was my first time hiking. And it was like so, so much peaceful because while we were doing the hike, like I just like admire whatever um, plants they were there. And like they taught us about animals, which I really liked. So I really love hiking. Oh, that's great. And I want to I want to um, turn to Heather to speak to a little bit of something that you, that you brought up, Maria, which is the idea of access, and that this isn't necessarily something that every family has easy access to. Um, and it's it's easy to lose sight of that, I think, because it's easy to think, well, the outside is right there. It's I go outside my front door, and it's outside. Um, but that's that's kind of not the case for all families in our community. So, Heather, what could you share a little bit about what are what's the gap? What are the barriers, um, and what are the things keeping from everyone everyone from having equitable access to the outdoors? Yes, Katie, thank you. Absolutely. Um, as as we've heard from Maria, Les, and Lexis, access to the outdoors is really critical for mental and physical health and well being. However, many communities are unable to safely access parks and green space. So let's take a step back here. And in 2010, the foundation commissioned the Parks for Everyone report to better understand gaps in access to green space in the San Diego region. And through the report, we discovered that while more than 45% of San Diego County's total land area is green space, many communities have limited access, which is causing decreased engagement in the outdoors, directly impacting both the mental and physical health of youth and families. And in response to the report findings, a movement began to emerge to connect diverse communities to experience the outdoors in a meaningful way. 
the foundation's opening the outdoors program was created to protect, connect, and increase, increase equitable access to the outdoors. And while there has been progress, there is still much work to be done. So pictured here is an updated map in the 2020 Parks for Everyone report. A decade after the original report illuminated disparities in available green space, this map shows that many San Diegans still lack equitable access to parks and nature. The blue areas on the map indicate less than eight acres of parkland for 1,000 people and below 51,000 median household income. The communities that suffer from the greatest inequities are those with higher concentrations of low-income households, communities with greater racial and ethnic diversity, and higher rates of COVID-19 infections. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated systemic inequalities and is impacting communities of concern at disproportionately high rates. So why do these inequalities persist? In the 2020 Parks for Everyone report, we learn about equity barriers. Equity barriers are obstacles that hinder a person's ability to access green space in parks in San Diego County. Obstacles include safety, walkability, transportation, cultural inclusion, and fees, permits, and expenses. And I'll quickly touch on each of these now. First, we have safety. Pictured here is a family trying to pass a, a trail in Borderfield State Park. Having not seen their family members from Mexico in over 15 years, they were determined to reach Friendship Park. As the vehicle road was closed due to flooding, they had to walk 1.8 miles each way and push their small children in strollers through mud and water. Oftentimes, the officials have closed the entire park to the public, including pedestrians, due to the conditions of the foot trails. Public safety remains a leading barrier to parks and green space. Risk factors include both real and perceived barriers, which can include everything from poor trail conditions and flooding to safety and security concerns for families and children. And next we have walkability. Many of the region's parks and open space lack the proper street access and walkability that is critical for pedestrians to enjoy the outdoors. For example, there are over 150 canyons throughout urban San Diego and yet only a small portion are accessible. Many are overrun with invasive species, trash, and other factors making them not accessible to residents. And when we consider transportation, without access to a vehicle or nearby public transit stops, many families are unable to visit local parks, beaches, or open space. For example, a trip from El Cajon to Ocean Beach that would take 20 to 25 minutes by car can take up to two hours by public transit. We also have cultural inclusion. When park signage, maps, events, and other information leading folks to green space are not presented in multiple languages, we are excluding large groups from, of people from accessing the environment. And additionally, when youth from underrepresented communities do not see themselves represented in outdoor staff and leadership positions, we're excluding large groups of diverse youth from accessing the outdoors and jobs. And finally, we have fees, permits, and expenses. For groups that face systemic barriers to outdoor access, subsidized and culturally appropriate outdoor engagement programs are a critical entry point to parks and beaches. However, land management policies can present significant obstacles to the nonprofit organizations that are providing this access. Policies often require special permits that limit equitable access programs to certain dates, less desirable locations, and low frequency of activities. Additionally, special event fees can be prohibitive. For example, just the fees to run a four hour beach event for a group of 12 youth can be as high as $240. So we know that people with less access to the outdoors have worse health outcomes than their peer. So creating safe and readily accessible access to the outdoors for all is a step towards building better health resilience and quality of life as we begin to address the systemic barriers. Heather, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I, as, as someone who, grew up spending lots of time in the outdoors. I'm almost embarrassed to say that many of these are things that I never even that I never even thought about um, keeping people from that are that are keeping people from enjoying these spaces. Courtney, I know this is this this work is right in your wheelhouse. When we think about these barriers that are keeping people from enjoying the outdoors, um, what's needed to overcome them? Thanks, Katie, and, and thanks, Heather, for, for sharing that important report. And, you know, before answering, I just I want to acknowledge my, my own privilege. Similar to you, Katie, I, I grew up spending lots of time in, in the outdoors with, with Girl Scouts and other community organizations, and, and I had access um, in a way that, that many don't. So, you know, I'll, I'll answer this um, as an aspiring ally, but, but look to Maria and, and Les to, to help answer as well. Um, you know, I think we need to 
understand also the context of you know racial and, and systemic barriers um, to accessing the outdoors. Um, I know that the foundation and uh, other conversations locally have been around redlining that San Diego County has experienced in our past. You know, redlining as a New Deal practice really drew literal red lines around black and brown communities in San Diego to discourage lenders from investing in those neighborhoods. And we were left with disproportionality in, in access to the outdoors, right? We've also had a, a history of not authentically engaging neighborhoods and, and community members. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we find ourselves in what we call, you know, park poor neighborhoods and, and communities of concern. Um, so how do we start to address these barriers? Um, I want to commend everybody on the conversation today uh, for taking the time to listen and, and learn about this issue. Um, and you, know, you can really find accountability in, in ourselves uh, when we are engaging in the outdoors to, to take a look around, uh, whether you're on a, a hike in Julian or out at Mission Trails at the beach and really ask ourselves, you know, uh, who is benefiting in these experiences? Uh, who is burdened by that experience? And, and who's missing from those landscapes and experiences and, and take on accountability and become stronger advocates in, in policy change, um, flex into greater philanthropic support for organizations who are building that bridge for access, um, you know, and, and continue your, your educational journey to learn about those barriers and, and how to overcome them. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of significant investment and, and shifts in creating more equitable access to the outdoors. But one of the things we have to really appreciate in that authentic relationship building with communities is, is looking to them uh, because they are closest to these issues and they're closest to the solutions, right? So that authentic engagement is absolutely critical. We also have to bolster protective factors for families, both in economic resources and increased service infrastructure, because we live in a dynamic where um, you know, family time and family time in the outdoors is, is a luxury for many. And to Les's point earlier, uh, this experience in the outdoors shouldn't be a luxury, right? It shouldn't be a nice to have. Um, and we have to lower, lower the stress and financial burden of families so that they can um, equitably access those opportunities. I mean, what you said makes me think of the um, adage in philanthropy and advocacy work, do nothing about me without me, right? We as, as, as funders, as people of privilege have to think about not doing things to communities, but doing things with communities and creating space for leadership um, in communities that traditionally have been left out of decision-making. It also, the, the thing that struck me when Heather first shared with me the map that she shared a minute ago was, Man, this looks really similar to the redlining map that we that we've looked at for our work in other spaces. Um, Maria, I, I know that you have been very involved in advocacy efforts recently from a youth perspective. Do you do you want to share a little bit with us about your recent advocacy work in this space? Yeah, um, so I recently met with um, 2020 with assembly member called Gloria and also um, uh, Representative Mike Levin, and we talked about the importance of um, outdoor access for youth and communities of color. And I believe that one of the points was like, why can't we have access to these outdoors when, when we are advocating for them and stuff like that? And I recently came to the thought of like, we aren't, we don't have those those organizations, or we don't hear from those organizations from. Um, like outdoor outreach or any um, others that help youth connect with the outdoors. And I feel like it should be something that, that us as youth should be more, more involved in. And also as a community, like for me, um, me joining outdoor outreach and then having these um, opportunities to talk to such important people about advocating for the outdoors. I let my parents know like, this is what I'm doing. And I tell them about the stuff that I'm learning. And I feel like that's one of the, the things that, that we can do all together as a community to let that information be 
be exposed to um, the people here who aren't familiar with like redlining um, because I didn't know what that was. And now that Les has um, taught me about it and I have learned about that, like I've been thinking like, my own, like I never knew about this or I didn't know that this was what was stopping um, communities of color from having access to these outdoors. And we especially talked about the, the South A Freeway, um, which has stopped communities from, from wanting that access or not having the ability to even access these places, which are crucial to like health and mental health. And I feel like we, we have to be more informed on these types of issues in order to, um, to raise awareness about them and also just just like from me coming from a low income family and a low income community, like even my park is like 15 minutes away and we don't feel safe. Whenever we go, like there's there's people like littering or there's um like people doing drugs or something like that. And I feel like we don't we don't take advantage of our parks because of that barrier of not being safe or not being like clean enough for little kids to enjoy themselves there. And we we don't have that um safety that we need to have in parts but we need to implement that that security within um like talking about that to different candidates who are running for i don't know mayor or any type of um position in order to talk about why we have to have these um outdoors here and for us to have access to them in order to um have our community more 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 healthy in a way and for you to have experiences in the outdoors and not have to deal with anxiety or depression or any type of other stuff without like having to go to a doctor instead like go to an outdoor space and hike around or take a walk because that can help too. Maria, it's so so powerful and I'm so impressed that you are already speaking with legislators about the things that you want to see changed in your community. Um, that we need more of that, and we all need to be doing more of that in, this, in, in the circles that we have influence in. So I want to share one more video in just a second, this one featuring a participant uh, from a YMCA camp, because I think it, it much like the, Lex, the video featuring Lexus, really highlights the importance of access to outdoor programming. Hi, my name is Claire, and I'm going to say a little bit about camp. Very good. <laughs> How do you want me to do it? Hi, my name is Claire, and I'm going to say a little bit about camp because it's awesome. I just love how they're always so, they're so inspiring. They're so outgoing and so happy all the time, and they just make me feel happy. And like, just seeing how excited they get and so, how into the songs they get, it just makes me feel like, so warm and fuzzy inside and I just love it so much and I love how no matter what no matter how I'm feeling I can always come up to them and be honest about it and they'll listen and they can always help me and it's just it makes me feel like I have someone there for me no matter how hard things get outside of here when it's not as easy as camp it's not as fun like they're there for me you know I just love that that they're so they care about me so much they see millions of kids but they care about me you know it just makes me feel good Camp is amazing. I can't even start to talk about camp. I feel like when I come here, like, on in the outside world, there's kind of a pressure and you kind of have to act a certain way to be respected, to be loved, all that, all that kind of stuff, to be liked, to have friends, to be popular. But when you come to camp, it's just nobody cares about that. Like, we can be so, we can be so weird and everybody loves it. And at first, my kind of, my mind was kind of like, okay, well, it's still going to be hard outside, but I can always be like, camp, camp, I'm so excited for camp, camp can be the one place that I'll have this. But I've realized when I come to camp and I see all these caring people, it makes me feel like I can use this outside of camp. I, why do I just have to be super nice at camp? And it's, it's really amazing when I come out of camp and I'm just like, I'm going to act like this person who I saw, I'm going to act like that person, I'm going to do this for someone one day. And it just makes me feel so good inside. First of all, I love that Claire says that it's a space where you can be weird. 
I think that's fantastic. But I think we also see echoed some of the things that we've heard from Maria, that we heard in Lexus's video, that we heard Les share, which is that that outdoor spaces camp is a space where you can kind of leave behind some of the problems that that you have in your day to day life, some of the stresses, and you feel that weight lifted. Um, Courtney and Les, I'd, I'd love to hear from you just a little bit about how the YMCA and outdoor outreach helps to overcome some of the barriers that we've heard regarding outdoor access. What are the ways that you're, that you're either bringing the outdoors to your participants or bringing participants to the outdoors? I could start off by, by sharing um, our, our old motto at Outdoor Outreach was play, learn, uh, share, and serve. Um, and it's while it's our old motto, I think it's still relevant in so many ways. Um, what we what we work to do at Outdoor Outreach is really connect youth uh, to transformative experiences in the outdoors that allow them to challenge themselves in new ways, that allows them to explore their world in new ways, um, as as well as connect with uh, powerful, supportive peers and mentors. Um, in that space that helps them to build a sense of belonging in that space. Um, for, so many of, for so many of our youth, as Maria had mentioned and as Lexus had shared, um, and even in, even in my own life, um, haven't experienced certain outdoor spaces until, you know, until they're much older. Many, many of our youth that live, say, in Southeast San Diego or in City Heights, or especially in East County, um, many of our youth live only 15 to 20 minutes away from the beach and have never been to the beach before. Um, and so an important part of that work and breaking down some of the barriers that Heather mentioned is bringing them to spaces, providing that transportation, lowering some of those barriers to access. And then the second step is helping to build a sense of belonging in that space, helping to build a sense of community in that space um, so that they're much more likely to then uh, go back to those spaces later on, teach others about the animals that they that they saw, what they learned in those in those experiences. But then from there, the work I think that 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 we do at Outdoor Outreach, as well as at the YMCA and across the Thrive Network, is really helping to to build and cultivate that that leadership, right? So after they've experienced the space, after they've um, gain that sense of belonging in that space. Now they're excited to bring others to that space. They're more excited to steward those spaces, right? When, as, as we think about environmental protection and some of the lofty goals that we've set as a state to conserve 30% of our land by 2030, what we need there is uh, the, for this next generation to be a generation of environmental stewards that feel connected to the spaces that they're that that they're recreating in, um, and then advocating for those spaces, and so it's it's really powerful to hear, um, you know, Maria's experiences in in those spaces. As I was sharing before we hopped on on this call, uh, we we got off of a, 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 a advocacy call with Senator Ben Huesa's office, and one of his staffers had mentioned. Hey, I used to be a part of outdoor outreach's programs uh, back when I was at Father Joe's shelter. And this is how it really changed and transformed my life. And that's the reason why I'm so passionate about Senate Bill 624 that focuses on environmental equity. That's the type of transformative experience that we, that we hope to see in cultivating a, 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 a new, more diverse cadre of leaders that are championing um, environmental, um, environmental issues um, and the next emerging environmental uh, issues of our, of our time. That's awesome, Liz. And I'll, I'll get a little camp weird on everybody. I'll give you a round of applause, right? And I'll raise the roof for you over here. And I, I see somebody in the chat shared that um, their child went to Rain Tree Ranch and then returned as a counselor, which is incredible and really goes to um, that stewardship that Les is talking about and, and that pipeline for uh, stewards and our, our outdoor professionals, right, which is another plank in, in our work with the Thrive Network across the country and, and in San Diego. Um, for, the, for the YMCA, you know, we've been um, hosting our resident camps. So up at uh, Julian Mountains, we have Camp Marston and Rancheria Ranch. I'm excited to share that Camp Marston is celebrating 100 years uh, this August. So everybody on the call is welcome to that centennial celebration. 
in August. Um, and our third down is in Imperial Beach. Um, so we do a ton of work uh, with school district partners and service clubs, churches, scout groups to come to those spaces. So again, brokering that uh, connection that Les also spoke about to get youth into those outdoors, right? We know that we grow um, and we really flourish when we are in new spaces, right? And, and we see that in the transformative approach to the outdoors. Um, we're absolutely committed to that friendship, achievement, and belonging um, in those spaces, as well as, you know, in our communities across San Diego and hosting day camps um, and before and after school programs, right? And, and having those fab principles or friendship, achievement, and belonging, we're building greater resiliency in youth so that if they do have adverse childhood experiences, they're able to, to bounce back, right? And to, to utilize uh, successful relationships uh, to strengthen themselves. Um, so we do a, a lot of work with the community in, in scholarshiping those opportunities as well for our three resident camps. One out of every four campers um, is scholarship to attend um, and, and we're always doing outreach to um, you know, ensure that nobody's ever turned away from a, a day camp or resident camp experience due to inability uh, to pay. That's fantastic. Courtney and Les, thank you both for sharing. We've had a couple of questions come in the chat. One from uh, Samantha, who works at the parks, about uh, what, what our panelists would like to see. And Samantha, I'm going to connect you with Courtney and Les afterwards so that y'all can talk programming partnerships and all. And then we had another question in the chat that Les would like to speak to. Um, the city of San Diego's Park and Rec Department has more than 43,000 acres of parkland with over 400 parks. What's your assessment of the city's efforts to address some of the issues we've raised so far? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, and hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, Mich Mitchell or Michael, um, but excellent question. Um, one, of, one of the things that, that I would look at in, in assessing kind of city, uh, city parks and recs inventory of acreage of, of parkland, um, I, would, I would look back to um, the Parks for Everyone report that Heather had, had referenced and really look at first and foremost, where are most of those parks located? Are they located you know, in communities, as Maria mentioned, south of the 8 freeway? Are they located in communities of color? Are they located in communities that were historically redlined um, out? And then for the parks that, that are located in those communities, I'd look at what, what, are, what is A, the accessibility of those parks to everyone that's within that community? What is the safety of those parks? What's the cleanliness and the maintenance of those parks? One of the, one of the things that we advocated for a few years ago was around Emerald Hills Neighborhood Park, um, park that uh, hadn't received or had, hadn't seen maintenance um, really over the past 50 years that the park had existed. Um, and that park is so central to the community, so many people utilize it, but yet it's, it's so under-maintained. Um, and so we were able to effectively advocate with the, with the voices of many of our youth leaders like Lexis and Tatiana and Dion um, that really advocated for, for that park space and were able to get $400,000 allocated towards uh, the park's redesign and redevelopment uh, to improve the park, to make it safer, to make the bathrooms um, something that that people would want to go there to use. Um, so as as you look as you look around at you know what's what's within the inventory of, of city parks and rec, I would consider you know where and and where the inequities exist um, in the parks that that exist there. I know that uh, city city of San Diego planning department were grateful that they've been at the table working with us at, at um, in, through the Thrive Initiative to really look at how they can bring about uh, more equitable park access through the park's master plan. And so that's been an area that we've, um, that we've placed a, a tremendous amount of advocacy um, around as well. And I, I could pass it over to Courtney as well, who's been leading a lot of, a lot of our efforts there or Heather as well. I, I think that the, the city of San Diego um, and the planning department is, is definitely headed in a different direction. And I think we have a really unique opportunity 
um, to, to pass that plan and to all help pass that plan, which, you know, really uses a unique algorithm in assessing uh, which parks have resources and which don't. Um, and, and that's a great start uh, to be able to get in investment and resources into these communities to increase that access. I think, and I think something that's that's clear as we're talking about these issues is that it's not something that any one organization can be, uh, that any one organization or even any one approach can be counted on to solve alone. Um, one thing that has come up a couple times is Thrive Outside and the Thrive Network, which is something that very much ties these three organizations, the, the foundation, the YMCA and outdoor outreach together locally. Heather, do you mind if I ask you to share just a little bit about what Thrive Outside is and, and, and how the network works together? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. I, my ears have been ringing with Thrive bouncing around mm -hmm. and I'm lucky, so lucky to work with Les and Courtney and all the other members of the steering committee. Um, but just to give you know some more information for those that don't know, in 2019, San Diego was chosen by the Outdoor Foundation as one of the four inaugural Thrive Outside communities. And the core goal of the initiative is to create healthy individuals, communities, and economies by making the outdoors a habit through repeat and meaningful outdoor experiences. And um, we are in San Diego, a capacity building region-wide partnership of nonprofit, philanthropic, academic, and government partners working to strengthen collaboration and regional efforts to promote equitable outdoor experiences for children and families. And Thrive Outside is really an excellent example of a focused and strategic investment that is really needed to move the needle. Each of these partner organizations, including our wonderful partners here at, from the YMCA and After Outreach, have come together to create a collective impact model that's focused on youth development and family engagement through the outdoors. So with that collective model, we have a common agenda, shared evaluation and metrics, a support structure and shared resources. So this strong network um, coordinates and combines all of our expertise um, so that all communities have, have access to and can enjoy the outdoors. That's our goal. <laughs> and it is something that is unique to San Diego and just a few other communities, but I think an approach that, that is needed in, in all communities. Um, one thing that I want to make sure that we talk about as, as we're kind of talking about any kind of programming, any community work, um, I think it's important to recognize that the past, gosh, I've been saying the past year, but I guess now I need to start saying the past 16 months have been highly unusual and which has created challenges for individuals and families and for nonprofits, community service organizations. Um, I think we have a slide to bring up, but, but Les, I want to turn to you. Could you share just a little bit about why outdoor programming has been so critical, especially in the past 16 months during the pandemic? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, over over the past over the past sixteen months, and it's it's still crazy to imagine that we've been in this for so long. Um, I'll never forget the date, March thirteenth, when you know the school district, San Diego Unified School District, needed to to close its doors to in person education, um, and when we also had to close our programs for a period of time as well. And what we what we saw in the weeks following that was. This huge, this huge need from students and from youth, um, just to, to still be able to maintain some some level of connection. Um, for them, um, as Maria had shared, the outdoors was so transformative and became such a such an embedded part of their lifestyle that, you know, being forced to stay at home as the as a stay at home order required really created um, a tremendous amount amount of anxiety. Um, hardships for families that, that were losing jobs, losing employment, um, and, and just a, a tremendous amount of distress. And so um, during, during that time frame, we did a lot of things virtually as you know, we're, we're all kind of acquainted with. Um, but by July, we were excited to reopen our programs. And what, what we saw was uh, two of the statistics that you see on the screen, 93% um, of our program participants expressed how important getting outdoors was in helping them to cope with COVID-19 and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and 79% of our participants 
had mentioned how much harder it would have been to safely get outdoors um, if it were if it weren't for outdoor outreach or programs like ours. I mean, outdoor outreach certainly is not the only program in this ecosystem. The YMCA also did a tremendous a tremendous job also getting youth outdoors as well, um, and several other uh, organizations within our network. And that was that was so key. It, it helps to um, as as I mentioned before, getting outdoors not only helps. Um, to improve that physical health for youth, but also their mental health as well. And, um, and so that was, that was huge last year. We saw um, that as youth were able to get outdoors more, um, they were able to thrive in many ways. Les, I think that's a, it's a really beautiful and, and important point that in this time of crisis, nonprofit organizations in, in San Diego County, certainly and other places have been so well positioned to support individuals and families in their variety of needs because they are already providing support. So we're, nonprofits have been in our region very much um, a, a cornerstone for, uh, for getting through the, the pandemic and all of its challenges and will continue to be so in, in recovery. Uh, Maria, I know this is something that you're comfortable speaking to, so I'm wondering, would you share with us a little bit about what your experience has been like in the past year or 16 months and, and the role that the outdoors have played for you? Yeah, for me, I feel like throughout the COVID pandemic, it was really hard to, you know, access these outdoors because um, recently, like a couple months back or December, a year ago, uh, my mom got sick. Um, from COVID and she was pregnant by, uh, with my little sister and it was really hard for us to like even have like that type of family visit to like a park because of um, the I, like the fear of getting um, COVID or um, any one of us just be being surrounded by people we don't know at the park and also because it wasn't um, well maintained and it was um, it had a lot of um, there was a lot of littering so I feel like that that part of um, you know not having outdoor outreach like with me throughout that time um, was really hard because I didn't know what to do like when I was going through that like I felt like oh am I gonna lose my mom am I gonna lose my sister so it was really hard but I just remembered like what outdoor outreach taught me like you know take take on to that challenge and like you know get something out of it like do something good out of that and learn um new, new things which for me was like, you know, try to get myself more busy and like not try to get that that problem get to me or, you know, just not just not fall into, um, I guess, depression or sadness and just, you know, just try to um, see the the brighter side of this of the problem. And it was it was hard, but, you know, just having outdoor outreach with me and like them providing me with opportunities such as like speaking here today and like other stuff. Like, I feel like that that was what like kept me up and like kept me going to you know just be like oh, okay like I'm going through this but like there's many things like I can do that can make me happy and you know just just try to let go of that but with um outdoor outreach and like other organizations that help youth um have access to these parks like I feel like I I had that that mentality of you know like I have the outdoors like I, I can just like go for a walk around my neighborhood and like still feel happy and like you know, just just walk around and feel peaceful. So I feel like like throughout this um, you know, COVID pandemic, like I feel like it has brought me down, but with outdoor outreach and like me um staying with or staying connected with um, resources such as like, you know, advocating for the outdoors or advocating for certain stuff, that I feel that that has what that has been what has kept me going. And I'm really grateful to to have organizations like these that are really crucial for um, my community and uh, communities of color. And I feel like having, having these resources and speaking about them has, has really implemented my, my belief and advocacy for the outdoors and many other things. I'm with you. My, my daily walks have been so important to me as I think they have been to so many others. And, and Maria, I'm hearing too from you that, that kind of our communities, how in whatever form they take, right? The people that we know we can lean on have become so incredibly important for all of us in these, in these crazy times. Uh, and, and something that 
that I think less highlighted beautifully that I want to hear from Courtney too is, is how nimble nonprofits and organizations have been, how quickly programming was able to change and adapt to be able to still provide that really important community for, for people who need it. Courtney, how has the YMCA's outdoor programming been able to adapt and, and what, ha, what, what were you able to still provide for folks in these times? I mean, I think as, you know, we really reconcile the communal trauma we've all been through and, and initiate the grieving process for so many things, right? The loss of a summer of resident camp for the San Diego YMCA, uh, the loss of a sixth grade camp experience for, for so many tens of thousands sixth graders um, across San Diego County is, is certainly something to, to grieve. Um, you know, fortunately with partnership with the San Diego Foundation and other generous donors, we were able to establish a day camp summer program last summer and still serve more than 2000 youth on a, a daily basis. And that was, you know, certainly a, a resource for working families, many of who, you know, uh, were experiencing occupational segregation, were essential service workers and, and had to be in work. So it was, it was both the care for school age kids as well as, social connection and, and a place to be healthy and, and they celebrate holistic health um, in the outdoors at our facilities. Um, but absolutely to make those adjustments, Katie, during the pandemic uh, was no easy feat. And you know my, my colleagues in our child and youth development space uh, were working around the clock to get safety protocols in place. Uh, safety led all of our operations, continue to lead all of our operations at our branches and our programs. Um, but at the end of the day, being able to see campers connect with one another and with uh, coaches and counselors and to have parents give the feedback that, you know, um, my, my child is back to who they are after months of, of virtual learning um, was transformational and, and the reason uh, we do what we do. Brittany, thank you for sharing that. And I know that uh, the San Diego Unified, the San Diego Foundation, many, many organizations in our community are focused on this summer, thinking about what's the experience that we can provide for young people to start rebuilding those critically important social connections um, and learning opportunities. So we are close to the end of our time together today, um, but when we have a group of folks together, we never want to leave you wondering what you should do next. So we have a few uh, calls to action, ways that you can help. Um, and first, there are some opportunities to learn. We'll be dropping some, uh, some links in the chat for you here related to these calls to action. First, you can learn more about the City Parks Master Plan that has, has come up a few times today or read the Parks for Everyone report. So these are ways to learn about the formal kind of park system that we have in our community um, and where they're headed. Of course, there are always opportunities to give. Uh, the San Diego Foundation right now is, uh, we have a committee considering grants uh, applications for our Opening the Outdoors program. So uh, if you were to make a gift to Opening the Outdoors at the San Diego Foundation, that will grow the amount of money that we're able to provide for programs like camps, like Outdoor Outreaches Program um, and others providing outdoor opportunities for youth. And we'll be granting those dollars this, this spring, like within the next month or two. Um, so that will be immediately out the door into the community to help young people get access to the outdoors. Of course, you can give to either of the phenomenal, oh yeah, we have the, uh, Jenny, you've got either a Q and A or a chat box open that's blocking the screen. Uh, you can give to either of the phenomenal organizations with us here today. Give to Outdoor Outreach to support their amazing programming to get young people into the outdoors and build resilience and leadership skills in those transformative spaces. You can also give to the YMCA's Kids to Camp campaign. As Courtney mentioned, they want to make sure that every kiddo has access to a transformative camp experience regardless of their ability to pay for it. And those that campaign goes directly to those uh, that support, supporting kids being able to get to camp. And of course, we hope that you will yourself go outside, enjoy the beautiful spaces that we have in our community. And while you're there, pay attention to who's there and who's not in those spaces and think about 
what might be keeping others from enjoying the spaces that are so meaningful to us. And with that, thank you all for joining us for today's conversation. Thank you to Heather, Maria, Courtney, and Les for being so generous with your time and your insights. And more importantly, thank you for the work that you do. We are so grateful to partner with you in this work. To everyone in attendance, keep an eye on your inbox. You'll be getting uh, two invitations this week. The first will be to the uh, next webinar in our series on June 9th. We'll be talking about climate and climate resilience. And to those of you who are fund holders at the San Diego Foundation, you'll be receiving an, an exclusive invitation to a sneak peek of our strategic plan, which we will be rolling out soon. So we are making sure that our fund advisors have, uh, have the first chance to see the strategic plan and a chance to ask questions of our executive team. Um, that will be on June 10th. I hope that you're able to join us for those. Thank you for being with us today. See you next time.